Welcome to the webinar today and good morning if you're joining us from the West in Europe and for those of you in APAC, good afternoon or good evening. I'm Dr. Robert Charnock. I'm the founding director of the Metis Institute, which is part funded by RSK. And as part of that relationship with RSK and the wider network, the question of today's webinar is something that's been on the cards for, I would say, a couple of years now in the background, but is really becoming a critical topic right now. And that is, how can we try to combine corporate disclosure efforts across climate and nature, or specifically, to use acronyms already, TCFD and TNFD, that's the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures and the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. And before I introduce the panel, I just want to uh, go over a few points of housekeeping. Uh, the first is that all of the attendees have their mics uh, muted automatically. But as we're going through the presentation, please do send in your questions and your comments uh, through the question function, through the chat box, and there will be a Q&A at the end. So there'll be a Q&A for 15 minutes at the end we're aiming for. Uh, and then finally, once this webinar is finished, we'll be following up. So there'll be a follow-up with the recording of the webinar and a follow-up with a survey as well. So it'll be great if you can complete that survey afterwards. Uh, but without further ado, I think it's great to introduce the panel because we really do have an outstanding uh, group today. So uh, first up, we have Luke Blower. Luke, perhaps you can join us. So um, oh, everybody, thank you. So if everyone can join us. So Luke, Luke is Senior Manager at WBCSD. Um, really, Luke's fascinating. I've, I've known Luke for a long time. I think we met back in your uh, CDSB days. But Luke's uh, efforts at WBCSD now really focus on the efforts to develop and advance the business case around sustainability, not just sustainability at large, but things like transition planning, looking at capital market engagement as well. Um, and as mentioned, Luke, before WBCSD, Luke worked at CDSB. So without going into acronyms too much, CDSB was one of the biggest groups influencing the formation of the International Sustainability Standards Board, one of the most influential and important landmark events of the last couple of years. And because of this vast experience, Luke's also a member of the Capitals Coalition Advisory Panel, IFRS Sustainability Alliance, Integrated Thinking Strategy Group, and World Intangible Council Initiative, and also part of the International Sustainability Standards Technical Reference Group when that was operating. So thank you for joining us today, Luke. Next up, we also have Toby Roxburgh. Now, Toby is a sustainability manager across nature and biodiversity at the ICAW, that's the Institutes of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. Uh, so Toby's a sustainability expert, as you would say about most of the, all of the panelists, I would suppose. 25 years across this though, 25 years across nature and biodiversity, integrating that into risk management, strategy, finance, reporting, policy. Um, so Toby's, Toby's background is really varied and I think this makes him an excellent panelist. So he's had roles at, senior roles at Deloitte and WWF. Uh, he's also been part of the working groups that you'd expect around TNFD but also Transition Plan, ta Transition Plan Task Force uh, more recently. But Toby's background is, is hugely diverse. It's across environmental sciences, economics, policy, uh, and industry, working across companies, finance, government, NGOs, all over the world as well. So again, thank you, Toby, for joining us, for making time today. And finally, I'm absolutely thrilled that Caroline Samson could make time to join us today. Caroline is the Head of Sustainable Banking at Oxbury Bank. Before a full introduction, I think what's incredible about what Caroline's doing at Oxbury Bank is they're really getting stuck into all of this. Even if the guidance isn't there, even if they don't have the resources they need, they're getting cracking in making a really excellent go at integrating climate and biodiversity across everything they do. So Oxbury, by background, as background, started trading in 2021 as a fintech bank focused on the food and agriculture sector, really looking at financing the rural economy of the UK. And Caroline's own background, again, as you expect from many people in this space, diverse, uh, has degrees in town, town and regional planning, economics, development practices, and that's from the University of Pretoria, and also a law degree from the University of South Africa. Um, so Caroline's experience really you know, a couple of decades in agriculture finance, but that spans commercial banking as well as development finance as well. So really covering the whole breadth. Uh, and then Linking it to the topic here, Caroline's also been part of the founding group of banks to develop the principles for responsible banking. And also, more recently, again, the common theme here, the Transition Plan 
Task Force. So thank you, Caroline, and thank you all three of you uh, for joining us today. I know this is a topic uh, that I've had many conversations with you about, and uh, I do have, have an agenda, but I'm sure the conversation is going to go many different directions. But first off, I think, Luke, I'd really like to invite you in, because I think just before we start getting into the detail and start getting excited about being nerds about all of this, I think it's critical to get that bird's eye view almost of the regulatory landscape and how or whether these frameworks are looking to to connect to each other you know is tcfd and tnfd looking to work together so maybe luke you could kick us off on that well thanks so much rob and uh, great to be with you all so yes maybe we start with a bit of uh, tcfd context since that's been around a, a little longer the final recommendations on tcfd really landed back in 2017 comes all the way from the fsb and financial stability board and g20 mandate the uh, central bankers and finance ministers said, we want to understand more about the uh, nature and distribution of climate risk in the economy. And then that brings expectations on transparency for financial institutions and of course, for the real economy. And so they provided their final recommendations and those were with time uh, incorporated into various pieces of regulation in different jurisdictions. You can see there's different scopes of uh, application and different approaches taken, but we see the UK picking it up, Canada, New Zealand, Singapore, Switzerland, Brazil, Australia, a whole range of countries uh, looking at the, the TCFD recommendations and then thinking about how can they apply in their own uh, jurisdictions. And then building on that, we see, of course, the development with the US Securities and Exchange Commission. They provided their final rule uh, quite recently it's now held up in a bit of uh, legal review, but uh, still very significant. Obviously, the largest capital market in the world is looking to bring in these uh, uh, disclosed recommendations linked to linked to TCFD. And then since that sort of TCFD momentum, we've we've gone further with the establishment, as Rob uh, mentioned earlier, of the ISSB, International Sustainability Standards Board, and they provided S1 and S2 general requirements, and then digging deeper into climate. And TCFD is incorporated in that S2, looking at climate. And we've now got over 20 jurisdictions, 50% uh, global GDP, 20%, 40% uh, by uh, market cap, uh, committing to implement the ISSB. Again, there'll be some translations, different uh, nuances in terms of scope and approach, but, but still significant momentum commitment on ISSB. And that's significant because this is a, a real standard setter under the IFRS Foundation taking uh, those the sustainability slows further, TCFD is a framework now, we're getting proper standards. And then the last one, maybe I'll finish up with uh, the EU, obviously huge momentum and shifts uh, with the European sustainability reporting standards uh, coming from FRAG then put in under CSRD. Um, high degree of alignment, of course, with ISSB and incorporating lots of the elements of, of TCFD some areas where they go a bit further, you know, on mitigation targets, mentioning on you know, different GHG requirements or energy mix disclosure requirements. And of course, they want to make the link to their own regulatory context. They think about the European trading scheme, emissions trading scheme. Um, but still, you know, really significant regulatory developments in a range of jurisdictions, but maybe just calling out that EU context at the end there. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pause. I think that's really interesting as well, because even though you're talking about it being UK context, you've been based in Singapore and speaking to people across APAC, um, you, you see that there's a real difference in the last few years with the amount of mandatory requirements and also the implications that these have for multinational corporates, the traction that this has with regulators across every country that I seem to speak to is, is much greater than it has been, I think maybe, well, definitely a decade ago or maybe even five years ago. But but I think the question for me, I mean, I admit my PhD is climate finance, not nature finance. So Toby, I mean, you're really the nature, more of the nature ex expert here. What, do you, what are you seeing around TNFD? I mean, is this momentum restricted to climate or are you seeing that TNFD is gaining that momentum and having that interoperability as well? Uh, thanks, Rob, and uh, also, yeah, delighted to be here. Thank you for the chance to join the panel. Um, so, building on Luke's Luke's background there, and moving on, reflecting a bit more on 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 the nature side through, in particular, the TNFD. It's worth perhaps um, setting the context a bit by 
re-emphasizing that, of course, whilst the TCFD's focus is on you know, atmospheric emissions and climate change risk, of course, the, the TNFD framework, which is now published um, uh, in, in the market, it covers all four realms of nature, if you like. So it's a more all-encompassing, holistic approach to uh, the natural systems that businesses interact with and depend on. So it covers land, oceans, fresh water, and the atmosphere. So you can see the sort of docking point there between TCFD and TNFD around atmosphere, if you like, but they connect together. And it, it's also worth um, noting that T TNFD, um, the recommended disclosures that it published um, now in the market are based on the same architecture um, as the TCFD, with its um, 14 recommended disclosures organised around the same pillars of governance, strategy, risk and impact management, of course. So, um, again, you can see that sort of harmonisation um, uh, and interoperability is sort of built in from the start. Um, and on, I mean, on to your question specifically about sort of uptake by regulators. Um, I mean, of course, the whilst the TNFD's recommendations are still voluntary, um, as, as you highlighted, as Luke's alluded to, they, they're already informing regulations and reporting standards um, around the world. So Luke's mentioned the EU um, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, or CSRD, of course, which mandates disclosure by companies operating in the EU from next year. Um, that um, all of the TNFD's 14 recommended disclosures are reflected in the SRS. There's been various um, like mapping documents and uh, publications that have sort of set out the connections there. So a, a great deal of harmonisation and commonality there, deliberately so. Um, ESRS also recommends using the TNFD so-called LEAP guidance, um, that additional guidance the TNFD produced alongside its recommended disclosures uh, to help companies um, um, identify and assess their nature-related dependencies, impacts, risks and opportunities as sort of uh, to inform the process of preparing for disclosures. And LEAP, of course, stands for Locate, Evaluate, Assess, Prepare. It's that sort of step-by-step -step journey. And so I think what we're seeing in the market is you know, many businesses are choosing to align with, on a, on a voluntary basis, if you like, uh, with the TNFD framework as a way to prepare for and get ready for ESRS. Uh, it's not a one or one or the other um, 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 choice, if you like. It's, it's a... Um, the, the two work together in harmony. Uh, Luke's also mentioned the ISSB standards, of course, and um, the IFRS um, sustainability disclosure standards, uh, of course, already require consideration of nature when preparing for climate-related disclosures. Uh, and then, um, importantly and significantly, earlier in 2024 this year, the ISSB launched um, several new projects, one of which is uh, to explore disclosures related to biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, drawing on the work of the TNFD. Um, and this move, um, I think it's important to highlight, you know, as, as I set out in the documents on the ISFD's website, follows growing interest uh, among investors um, in, in the nature uh, agenda. And um, again, as Luke's mentioned, given the number of jurisdictions that are on a, on a, on a runway to um, adopt and implement ISSB aligned um, reporting regulations and frameworks, you know, that is significant. Um, and I think Again, you know, a couple of other points linked to that. Um, I think what's also interesting about the ISSB's announcement is um, the growing understanding, understanding in the documents uh, and the rationale for those new projects is the understanding that businesses' dependencies and, and impacts on nature can both create material financial risks. Of course, the ISSB's focus is on that investor-oriented um, information. And so I think we'll see increasing focus um, over the coming years uh, in the ISSB standards on impacts, which is an aspect, if you like, that's been traditionally considered um, largely non-financial information, uh, but that's now important um, as part of the sort of preparation of financial reports. So I think overall, just to wrap up, I think there's, uh, what we're seeing is, if you like, a sort of clear market trend towards increasing transparency um, and corporate responsibility on nature. And that trend, if you like, is characterised by like a growing convergence towards this integrated approach uh, on climate and nature within um, regulation and reporting frameworks. So, you know, it's, it's definitely an issue. Um, the, the time really to take that integrated approach and start thinking along those lines is, uh, um, I would suggest, sort of, um, definitely um, uh, timely. Yeah, and it's, it definitely coincides with what we're hearing. Uh, so, for example, we're being approached about 
training events and workshops to run in 2025, focusing on biodiversity risk, on biodiversity scenario analysis. And that all comes from groups watching ISSB SD very closely, you know, to see what nature looks like, uh, you know, in, in those regards. But I suppose on the one hand, it can be watching what the developments look like, but then you have group people like Caroline, who, you know, instead of just watching is cracking on with that. I think that's the different views. I think what we've got is this really nice, big overarching view TCFD being established. I think Toby, you make a great point. It's not just that TNFD might be added in to that process, but TNFD because it's nature and because it has that much wider view, TNFD could become the umbrella almost because nature um, has that touch point with climate, but climate could arguably be a subset. Whether that's a longer term prospect, I don't know. I don't think it's one we'll get onto today because we're a long way off that stage is my sense, but I'm happy to be disproven. Um, I mean, Caroline, you've, you've been, you've got started with this. We've talked about it in a, in a wide range of ways. I mean, maybe for, to begin with, why why did you get started so quickly instead of just watching the debate and what are you seeing about trying to bring the two things together thanks rob um i mean i think what makes us a special case is we're an agricultural bank so we finance farmers at the moment specifically in the uk and so climate risk and nature risk is basically integral to our business and so from the start we we said if we are going to disclose, it is going to be a much more logical process to bring both together in one space. Um, so we've, from a preparation perspective, way back in 2022, it feels like way back, um, we combined all our governance documents, we updated all our policies and terms of references for board committees and all of that to combine nature and climate already in that process. Um, and we set out an integrated risk assessment process across the various dimensions of how we define natural capital um, at that point. So we've done detailed analysis on things like the dairy sector and the cereal sector in the UK. Um, and those have, it was a lot of work at the time, but they now kind of embedded in how we think about things. And so my relationship managers have been trained they understand that when we look at a, a loan application they're not just looking at climate they're not just looking at animal welfare they have to consider wider biodiversity in that process as well and it's very much part of how we've tried to bring this into our day-to-day -day activities because we do understand we're a bank our average loan term is 21 years on our term loans so given that we're going to be lending into this very long period with uncertainty, we need to start looking at what those risks and impacts could be. And we need to identify best practice from our customers where we can already. Um, the other thing that we've done once we did that work from a disclosure perspective, we then from a materiality perspective, basically focused on our top 20 exposures when we started reporting. And so we map those top 20 exposures to the best of our abilities. And even just in the mapping, initially we found some, some lessons around how do we need to think about some of the business models that we have. Um, and our first efforts were really very much around counting things. So how many hectares of arable land is there? How many hectares of woodland? How many ponds and how many kilometers of hedgerow kind of thing? So it it's very much initially not been a, a very detailed effort, but it, it was just establishing some baseline information. And none of this was verified on form initially either. But that that work has now set the scene for us to identify additional areas where we want to focus. Um, and so I do think this is going to be very much a process. This is You're not going to be able to kind of start in year one and say, oh, we're aligned. Um, there's going to be ongoing work here because it just, there's so many dimensions that now have to be taken into consideration. So just to pick, just following up on that then, because, so when we looked into this with say, back in 2021, um, we did some work for the Financial Reporting Council on climate scenario analysis. And at the time, what we heard from everybody we spoke to was a high degree of anxiety about getting started. 
they could see what was needed and getting to that point just felt impossible especially impossible during the first attempt um, and I, I feel you, you, hear, you hear a similar thing around TNFD but are you saying Caroline that the fact that you've done a lot of baselining work that maybe was more climate focused in the past kind of gives you a different starting point on TNFD? I think if you have experience of TCFD it does give you a, a a place to start because you've done materiality assessments, you've, you have a view on what your value chain looks like, where those elements start. So I definitely think it it is a good starting point. I think the very big difference that we found in the process is applying LEAP because mm. in climate a ton of carbon is a ton of carbon. Um, so there's, there is that doesn't matter where it is kind of moment. Whereas as soon as you start applying LEAP and you are location specific, um, it does force some different thinking because you can't generalize so much anymore. You do have to get to much more site specific information. Um, and that at the moment I think is a challenge, but it also it's kind of an interesting journey once you start setting off to go and figure out what you need to answer some of the, the basic TNFD answers around it. Um, so you, I have found all kinds of maps around water scarcity in the UK and things that we weren't planning on looking for originally. So it does, but it, and I, I think the real thing with TNFD is going to be to make peace with the fact that it will not be perfect. Mm. You are going to have to have some kind of route map that's much longer potentially than what your TCFD implementation was. Mm. I, Toby, I know you'll want to jump in here the, because the ICAW has been looking at this as well, right? So, that, yeah, that's that's right. And uh, Carolyn, it's been uh, wonderful to hear more about your um, you know, pioneering work. And of course, um, you know, noting that I think it was it was a year ago, round about now, that uh, Forico also produced its um, integrated climate and nature report as well. So. Um, yeah, these, these um, pioneering examples that are looking to bring these two frameworks together are really important because, as, as you say, um, you know, in, our, in our work at the Institute, um, um, we, we see more and more that it, it is a process, right? It's, it's a very much a learning journey that's, um, that's iterative and um, um, is about sort of building detail and complexity over time. Um, and I think uh, you mentioned these workshops, Rob. That's right. We, we, we're running um, uh, you know, across our nature-related work. One of the projects we're looking at is around the use of biodiversity scenarios um, as as a key part of that process, right? enabling you to look at um, how your risk exposure might change over time. And it's arguably something that you get to um, um, yeah, down the line after you've done that initial baselining assessment, perhaps your sort of first pass at your your, your risk exposure. But nonetheless, a key part of the toolkit. I think. It, we saw it uh, sort of anecdotally, or we heard that, you know, particularly in the finance or in the finance sector, for example, so around half of entities perhaps are at that stage of doing that high-level um, initial materiality assessment. Um, perhaps another 40% are starting to dig into um, those key impacts and dependencies uh, in a little bit more detail, and and perhaps around 10% sort or of, of, of perhaps the most advanced are starting to think about. Um, and, and quantify, if you like, the, the financial materiality of these. So, um, it's it's a the, the market is is definitely experimenting, um, and you know progress is being made. But I guess um, um, you've got these published examples, but uh, behind the scenes, uh, you know, a huge amount of work going on that's um, not necessarily yet translated into external reporting. So just on that, Toby, for, for those in the audience who are less familiar, I mean, first off, can you explain a little bit of what a biodiversity scenario would look like and how it's used? And then maybe because of these roundtables and workshops you've been running, is there, can you just create a hybrid climate biodiversity scenario or do you have to have them separated out? No, well, that's, 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 that's a great question and it's not necessarily a straightforward answer, but um, as I say, the um, I mean, scenarios are you know been widely used for for several decades um but they've not necessarily yet been um trialed and used and applied yet widely in the context of nature for all sorts of uh, reasons which we might we might come on to um uh, but essentially they they are it's you know scenario analysis is a way to 
you know, to, to summarize, sort of test the resilience of your strategy in the face of future uncertainty. So, um, yeah, scenarios are a key part of the TNFD toolkit. Uh, TNFD, in addition to its um, uh, published recommended disclosures uh, and the LEAP framework, the LEAP framework recommends the use of scenarios as part of that. Um, and um, the TNFD also produced additional guidance on, on the use of scenarios. So it tends to be a, a process, as I mentioned earlier, that um, one would get to after doing that initial baselining assessment, you know, really starting to illuminate Carolyn, as, uh, Carolyn, as, you, as you've mentioned, um, um, exploring and uh, defining your value chain, going through LEAP, right, to assess your impacts and dependencies, perhaps to generate a, if you like, a current risk profile. But scenario analysis can be brought into the mix there to, in order to provide a, a sort of fuller, richer picture, if you like, of the different kinds of driver that might be critical to your um, risk um, and opportunity uh, profile, if you like. Um, I hope, Rob, does that, does that make sense yeah. so far? Um, I think it does, and you're right, Toby, we'll come on to a lot of this, I think, as well, because if you look at combining TCFD and TNFD, it's easy to focus in on scenarios because the scenario analysis piece is a, is a hugely analytical part of the process, but it's by no means synonymous with the two either. It's, it's one very much one component to lay a strong foundation. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, obviously you've had the round tables, Luke being part of a member organization, just curious what your view is as well, because obviously you'll hear from your members and if they're a member of WBCST, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, they I would assume be taking sustainability quite seriously already. So, what 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 are you hearing about the two being combined? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, at WBCSD, we uh, run TCFD prepare forums with uh, groups of um, real economy kind of sector leaders, and we also run TNFD pilots. So, um, built that kind of company experience with over you know, fifty participants. Uh, 50 companies uh, looking at how do you identify and assess risk and opportunity, how do you begin to look at financial effects, what sort of metrics are helpful, uh, yeah, beginning to get into the scenario approach, perhaps a bit more on the climate side and earlier stage on nature. Um, and we've also provided guidance on climate scenario analysis, we have a climate scenario catalog online, and then uh, on the nature side, we have our nature positive roadmaps. Uh, all helpful resources kind of helping people get started on different elements of this, these challenging questions. What have we seen from those uh, efforts? Well, I'll start with an obvious one. Clearly, internal collaboration with companies is, is really crucial. Bring together risk, finance, communications, operations, procurement, climate, nature, investor, you know, list can continue. But bring together those people. And we know that when companies have found most value in this process is when they've sort of created those little internal working groups or committees almost, uh, and then people kind of bounce off each other and you can divide and conquer so that someone can go and think about um, particular technical questions, someone else can think about how we uh, think about framing this and what sort of message can we provide. Um, so do that internal collaboration. I think there are also things in this internal process that you can do jointly. Um, clearly, you know, when it is a bit more about that kind of process uh, approach, uh, thinking about the board and management role, or thinking about the integration into the existing risk management process, which taxonomy, registers, uh, assessment, prioritization. You, know, you can think about how you can combine climate and nature, and you can take the learnings on the detailed classification of risk, you know, it's physical acute or transition, or a policy side of the opportunity or the implications for products and services. Yeah, there's ways that you can um, kind of bring the climate and nature themes together in, in those kind of areas. Also on the on financial effects, you know, it's helpful to do these impact pathways. You can think about the implication for a business and then how that might show up in terms of um, financials. But clearly, as everyone's alluded to already, there are things in nature that are very different. You know, location and context is critical. It's all about how and where do you depend on um, nature, what impacts might you have in particular um, settings, and also what's the state and condition of that nature. Go back to some of the kind of um, natural capital accounting things, you, you've got to look at um, yeah, what's happening with that, that natural capital. Um, also the scale question is critical, so we're saying you know, location, context, but 
ultimately we need to think about this aggregation from you know, particular site to then to product then to corporate then to whole value chain and, and then in the nature context you know you can go from like genes to species to communities to habitats to ecosystems to buy um, and i don't want to add to the complexity but it's just it is helpful to think about this difference and then caroline's already made a good point on uh, emissions versus the, the range of things that you look at in the nature context. So I think there are things that you look at slightly differently for TNFD. Um, you know, you, you can go back to some of the work that's been done for decades, of course, on environmental impact assessments or looking at particular operational data with sourcing approaches and understanding water consumption and withdrawals and then the context of a watershed. You know, there's things that have been around for some time, restoration and remediation as well, especially in you know, particular industries with uh, big physical footprints. Um, but there are other things that are newer. You know, you start to look at the, um, uh, you know, ecosystem services and state of nature. Those are newer expectations for, for companies. Uh, I'm sure Toby will have ideas how companies can get started looking at that data and, and there's new technologies that can help with that. But it's, but it's definitely uh, more challenging and then Nature transition planning, nature scenarios, again, kind of newer areas. So, but the way to get started is on, especially on TFD, is to certainly to sort of narrow that scope, do do sort of pilot approaches, think about potentially the material sectors, commodities, business activities um, in priority areas, locations, mm. and and build out the assessment from there. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely overwhelming to sort of think about nature across the your whole business um it's good to good to structure it and, and start somewhere smaller and it's interesting that it aligns i think if i'm not wrong caroline with with some of the earlier comments because that internal collaboration piece across functions it can simply be as simple as identifying the right people all the way through to helping those people speak the same language because it's not just climate or biodiversity it's also now finance strategy risk too so finding that common language to help that collaboration is key the integration into existing processes with climate you've learned a lot you might be able to find similar ways of linking it in governance too but to me from what i'm hearing it sounds a bit more like the technical or the scientific basis is where you're having to take quite a distinct approach now caroline considering you've done this I'm just, can we get a bit grounded a bit practical in the sense of you know is that is that accurate is it the scientific and the technical where you kind of have to just separate the two out at least temporarily I think very much so. And I, I I was just thinking, I mean, the first version that we did of Nature Disclosure, which is in our 2023 report, it felt incredibly academic to me in some ways because it was going back and learning and trying to understand ecosystems and biomes. And when the guidance says you need to drive about impact drivers and then literally going off and going to find the definition and going, okay, well, if it is this, then how do I relate this back to however many cows or something like that? But it um, it's a very, the initial effort really felt quite, I say really not that tangible. And I think part of that reason was in version one, my location was the UK. Draw one circle around a big island. Whereas version two, which is the, the latest report, because we went down to those 20 specific locations, and I was looking at, okay, here's a farm in Devon or Lincolnshire or Cambridgeshire or wherever, you, it suddenly becomes more tangible and you can start, and, the, the kind of academic language became, I think, more, here's what this e means in practice. And so I do want to say to anybody starting this out, version one might very well feel you're doing all kinds of things that doesn't feel natural in a world of natural capital. Um, but it, it is going to be around getting the more specific you get, the easier it might become to, to translate that very academic technical language into something that, that people can understand. And I mean, I do a big shout out to TNFD for their guidance, their LEAP guidance. You can basically take and just go through it line by line and go, have I done this? Have I done this? There's enough documents and 
sources and resources in there that can get you very, very far down through a disclosure process. Um, but it it is then very much around how do I now communicate this to the rest of that committee or team. Um, we did, as a, a bank, we've trained everybody on climate literacy. And so our next step is going to be to start translating the nature language now in practical terms to everybody because it does help. Mm. I, want, I want to, uh, in a moment, I want to turn to a slightly different topic. But Caroline, just to just to continue on that, if if somebody is getting started on the first attempt, already TCFD is already established to an extent, maybe a couple of iterations in. What would you recommend doing for that very first attempt, and how would they, you know, leverage the work they've done on TCFD already to help? I mean, just a very short, practical piece of do this advice, if you can, <laughs> if it's not too much to ask. I mean, like I said, governance is, is to a certain extent the easy one. Just make sure your policies and your terms of reference has been updated to, to be broader than that just climate. Um, I used our carbon footprint, I still use our carbon footprint on the TNFD disclosure, so that we use the same assumptions when I have to report on water usage. I use the same assumptions sitting in my, my carbon footprint. Um, so you might as well use your carbon footprint as well in this process. Um, risk, Some the language is the same, um, and you can, you'll find some overlap in the process on the risk side. I think it gets more difficult when you, once you get to strategy to really combine it depending on your business model. Our business model is easy because it, it has to do with land. I think if you're more corporate, it might be slightly more difficult to, to combine those two. Um, and then I think just start. It, it really does not have to be perfect in, in version one. Just try and, and do what you can. And the other thing is you are going to need a map. Google Maps, it's a wonderful tool in this case. So just draw whatever line you need to draw on a map because that's the other like pretty much basic start that you need. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, okay, I mean, I'm glad you gave a shout out to TNFD's guidance as well because I think that was one of my bigger fears when we you know, proposed the topic for the webinar. Of, is, is, the, is the main takeaway going to be there's not enough guidance out there? And, and with these things, you know, these things evolve so much year on year. Anybody knows this, the new acronyms or the new techniques. Um, but I suppose one of the questions really is if this is going to be made easier for businesses, if this is going to be made easier across the whole of the market as well, and not just those who are leading and engaged and where it makes most sense. I mean, what needs to happen? And on the one hand, you could talk about the resources, you know, the roadmaps, data sets, and so on. But I think there's another question of who needs to come together to work on this? Is this driven by government? Is it TNFD's job? Is it now handed over to industry bodies? Um, and considering, you know, Toby and Luke, I know you kind of work in these areas. I, I, I just kind of want to open this up to all three of you in a way to say what needs to happen in terms of who has to come together to really support businesses in making this more practical and making progress. So maybe Toby or Luke, either of you want to start off. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, Rob's a great question, right? And um, I guess we're all interested in helping to create the enabling conditions to uh, to to make it uh, um, easier to, 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 to embark on this journey for, for companies, finance institutions, and then you know, there's a public sector angle to this as well, right, um, organisations generally. So, I mean, maybe stepping back, I mean, I think, um, you know, thinking about the overall um, building blocks, if you might conceptualise it that way, that need to happen to, 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 to get there. And I think, you know, what, one of those, you know, one of those key building blocks is around the policy and regulatory framework. You know, again, in that bucket, I'm, I'm referring, I guess, to um, regulation and standards around reporting, for example, because you know, one thing that businesses uh, helps businesses and businesses need in the voice, what we're hearing, key messages that um, certainty helps. Right? So, um, and we talked about some of the 
evolutions in the market recently. So, uh, of course, you know, we have a lot of the building blocks in place for climate. So, you know, from, from Paris Agreement to national policies, regulation, but also things like sector decarbonisation pathways and then reporting standards, of course. So there's a lot of focus, I think, this year, and particularly in the run-up to COP16, um, around um, um, around this to help create the enabling conditions um, to enable business to think about climate and nature in an integrated way. Right? So we have the global biodiversity framework goals and targets, you know, the nature equivalent to Paris. Um, I think more needs to be done to translate that to national policies and incentives. So, for example, there's a um, we, we've mentioned transition planning, and I think the, the growing, growing global focus on uh, developing on enabling the market to create, um, if you like, integrated or what might call holistic climate and nature transition plans, if you like, bring this together. Because of course, it's more than a reporting exercise. This is about trying to align businesses to enable them to adapt to physical and transition risks and to thrive in the future sustainable economy that we need. So um, there's a lot of work happening um, um, in this space around transition plans, a lot of new initiatives exploring how this might work in practice. Um, um, developing, if you like, exploring um, potential for developing nature positive sector pathways and scenarios, um, um, as well as mapping out, if you like, what a, a policy and regulatory re regime might look like. So um, I think we need to keep up the momentum on that. Uh, and indeed, um, I see it only as one of 10 global accounting bodies through the Global Accounting Alliance that sort of committed to uh, supporting governments, regulators, and standard setters to help. Yeah, build out this architecture. Uh, and then I think maybe one more point from me um, on the enabling conditions is, of course, there's, there's an onus on businesses to act, and, and many, many are. And we've heard some great examples on the call. You know, uh, congratulations to, to Caroline and team at Oxbury. Um, uh, but I think it's part of this, and again, it's one of the focuses, um, areas of focus of around COP16 is building capacity generally in, within business, finance, and I guess within my ICAW hat on within the accounting and finance profession. So, um, yeah, this is an area I think we um, you know, probably all agree on is needed. Uh, but there's lots of dimensions to it. Perhaps others might want to expand that uh, we need to look at. And, you know, our view is that we, you know, our mission, if you like, as a chartered institute, professional body acting in the public interest is to enable our members to become competent. Uh, so they can successfully integrate nature, if you like, in their day to day roles and practices whether that might be as a CFO, a board member, report preparer or assurer, we need to build that nature literacy. Mm. I mean, Luke, I'm conscious of time, Luke. I mean, what, what would you add to what Toby's been saying? I think there's a few components, but you're well positioned to comment, I think, to add to that. Yeah, just quickly. So at WBCC, we often talk about the need for uh, strengthening the corporate performance and accountability system on, on sustainability topics. So what does that look like for climate, for nature, for equity, and in the end, how you bring those together? And that includes you know, thinking about those kind of points of governance, uh, dealing with risks and opportunities, targets, strategy, performance, measurement and management, and then ultimately how do you provide decision useful information into the into capital markets. And I think on climate and nature, there's different areas that will need some strengthening. You know, we're still often always <laughs> grappling with the data collection and access and, and how do you use that, especially on the nature side, you know, you mentioned already thinking about kind of that state and condition uh, information on, on nature. Um, we're working progress on the target setting side as well. You know, it's, we're getting the context site specific stuff with SPTN, but uh, perhaps we need more focus on what are the expectations on a, on a value chain or corporate or sector overall. And, and also as uh, Toby says, working progress on the transition planning uh, guidance. And in particular, how do you make that link into the policy developments um, on climate? You know, we need to strengthen that kind of financial connectivity. We need to understand a bit more about impact and greater sort of spheres of influence. What's the contribution that a company is making in the low carbon transition? Um, there's other things in it, but we should think about that overall uh, accountability system um, that can enable these uh, transitions, the nature positive transition, uh, low carbon transition. And in particular, think about the connectivity between 
uh, real economy and financial institutions. What does it actually look like to sort of understand how we can scale finance flows for, for those outcomes that we want to see? Um, you know, how do you actually sort of match the solution that can come from the real economy to the to the resourcing that can come from the financial institutions? Okay, okay. I mean, so obviously we've got 15 minutes left and I do want to make sure we leave plenty of time for questions. So everyone in the audience, please, you know, uh, put your questions, send them through. Uh, the panel will be very happy to answer them. I think one one thing that I wanted to really bring up as one of the first questions like, that that's kind of opens this up to a slightly wider um, look is what's just been mentioned by Toby and Luke. That in a way, this policy level, this government level, and we've got COP16 for biodiversity, COP29 coming up for climate. Um, I mean, what is it? With these talks, it's so difficult for people outside the kind of clique of the talk sometimes to understand their significance. With regards to today's topic, making progress with TNFD and linking it to TCFD, what are the kind of things that you'd be looking for from COP16 and or COP29? Um, I'll just open that to all three. Like I say to the audience, keep sending questions in the chat in the quest via the question function, please. I'm happy to jump in uh, first if helpful um, and it's maybe a bit of a recurring theme but I think that's helpful because we're sort of clarifying uh, and focusing. I do think the momentum on transition planning will be really crucial actually in both contexts. So with um, COP29 uh, as a Bajan, there's interest in how do we, at the top level political interest, how do we enhance uh, the next round of uh, NDCs, nationally determined contributions. And increasingly, so there's a conversation on what does it look like to sort of strengthen the public-private collaboration in that setting. And so we're talking then about how do you connect the company, uh, real and financial institution transition planning, how do we connect that to what the national plans are? And how do we get the resourcing in place to, to scale that? So it's a really interesting area emerging on that connectivity between private sector and uh, public sector. Uh, which has always been a theme, I suppose, but I think now as we're beginning to crystallise, well, what does that look like in terms of the policy dependencies that you see in companies' transition plans, and then the things that they are advocating for uh, in terms of unlocks on the policy side. And it's a similar thing maybe on the on the nature side. I mean, we're earlier stage, but I think the TNFD guidance will probably come on nature transition plans, and that Cali meeting is part of it is about the implementation of the global biodiversity framework. And some of that is, well, how do we get the momentum on these national biodiversity strategies and action plans, which are, of course, dependent on the, the economies uh, that, uh, that those countries are, um, that connectivity. So there's, a, I think, a bit of a recurring theme that it's at different stages, but basically, how do we get this kind of connectivity, public to private sector, to ensure we've got the plans and then the resourcing and the unlocks that can bring nature positive solutions and, and transition to low carbon economy. And what about yourself, Caroline? I mean, if, if, is, is it that connectivity that you would look for from these talks that come or what do you tend to look for? What will you be? I think in this specific as I'm with Luke, um, transition planning is kind of the next um, element of this and the sooner there's some form of guidance the sooner we can start saying, well, we're going to need this at some point, let's forward plan, let's see how we're going to integrate it. Um, so for me, it's very much around what's going to come around, bringing that connectivity at a transition plan level next. Um, and then just being able to kind of see where the thoughts are going, because a lot of this does take preparation. Um, again, different to TCFD, you could get very far down TCFD disclosure without needing to do a lot of upfront work, whereas nature is different. You're going to do need to do a lot more preparation. Um, so you need, do need to think forward quite a lot with quite a longer horizon. We've got, a, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Toby, I don't want to stop you from commenting on COP. Do you have any quick one or two headlines for what you're watch from, watchful? Well, no, thanks. I mean, really just, I, yeah, I agree with everything Luke and uh, Caroline have alluded to there. But I mean, perhaps just to underline, I think, um, you know, we'll be keeping an eye on, I think it's important to, to, to um, 
note that uh, key focus at COP will be on review of you know, by governments of their you know, progress towards GBF goals. Um, um, Luke's mentioned national biodiversity strategies and action plans, NBZAPs, right? Which um, you know are due to be published and revised um, in the run-up to COP. You know, um, around now. So, you know, I think questions around you know will these strategies you know provide that clarity that um, markets I think need or will benefit markets in terms of providing that certainty um, around things like um, introduction of mandatory nature reporting target 15. Um, yeah. mainstreaming of nature into economic and fiscal policy or rather aligning economic and fiscal policy and incentives um, you know with, with GDF outcomes uh, and subsidy reform and so forth you know will they be light touch or will they um, you know we, we're yet to see really what the what that trajectory looks like and I think um, you know for that those targets and the way governments respond to translating them nationally will be key to you know will have profound implications for business and finance and um, certainly something that um, will be a big focus this year. Yeah, well, it's always a common theme as well, taking that global perspective, the global target, translating it down to different levels, national industry, corporate, it's such a huge part of the process. Um, interesting question from Jack that's come in is saying, asking about greenwashing, because saying that you know, there's the potential that the risk of greenwashing with nature disclosures could be a lot higher than climate, particularly because of the complexity, the diversity of nature-related impacts, and also the availability of expertise that's relevant to this. So mm. just asking if you've got advice on how organizations can manage that, um, if their understanding of nature especially is lagging behind where they are on climate, but also whether if they then try to combine nature and climate together, does that start giving a false impression of rigor if they're really only just getting started on nature? It's kind of slightly mm. dishonest in a way. I mean, Caroline, maybe you have some thoughts on this. Um, I mean, I think step one there is you are going to have to disclose what you don't know to a certain extent, and not only what you do know when you're doing these disclosures. And so the one thing from being a very, very early adopter is at the moment, there is no real uniform agreement on what are the, the measurements that one is looking at, um, what exactly is going to be the metrics, etc. cetera. Um, and we've very much taken a route which says we're disclosing what makes sense to us and we're disclosing what we have data for. Um, and I think the one risk that I see is that there could be some kind of consensus that develop around certain metrics getting prominence, but which in kind of a local context won't necessarily make sense. Mm. So I've, I have, um, we have a table with mean species abundance data in our report. And as I said to people, it's kind of because it's expected, because all that it tells you is what you can see out of a train window if you go from London to anywhere in the north in the UK, there is more species abundance the further north you go. So there's there's that kind of thing that I think um, there is a risk that, that there'll be a consensus around certain metrics and they won't actually be that meaningful. Um, but yes, I think at this point, it is very, there is very much a a risk in how people disclose and so it, it is going to be when you read a report that combines nature and climate to try and see what the company is saying it, it can't disclose is, is going to be as important as what is actually being said yes we know this. Mm, that's an interesting one because when people were getting started with TCFD and climate scenario analysis Part of the anxiety they faced was alleviated when they realized, okay, we need a plan for getting up to speed on this. And so long as we're transparent about our plan and it's a good and, and we're going to pursue this, that's a much stronger position to be in. It's it's very honest about we don't know this, but we're committed to knowing it. I think it's all that you can do at the moment because there is there's a lot of expertise on the ecology side very detailed scientific knowledge, but how you bring that into a corporate disclosure is not clear. And it is just going to be by people trying that we're going to get to a point where we know how to do that. 
And that's why we do need people to adopt, to try and not to be scared initially that it's going to be wrong. Yeah, yeah. And um, conscious of time, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, there's another question that's come in. So I'll ask that and obviously Luke and Toby, if you have more comments on greenwashing, please feel free to bring them up as well. But the, another question was recommendations for gauging the financial materiality of nature. And since that's come up quite a few times, I think it's a fair question of that, that sort of more practical recommendations. Um, so how for gauging the financial materiality of nature to your business activities? especially with regards to the more positive or the enhancement actions as well. Um, so I don't, I don't know who wants to volunteer for that, uh, but I think that's an excellent question on the gauging of financial materiality as well. Mm. Well, Toby? Last, Rob, just uh, I mean, a few initial thoughts. I mean, it, it is a great question and I think, um, you know, it, it, we hear it across the market. I mean, this it, it points, and I think part of the answer comes back to a lot of the points that, that Karen has mentioned. That to some extent, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of trial and error and learning around this. Uh, but um, equally, um, you know, we the market would benefit from further guidance, um, um, as well as um, increasing um, sharing of knowledge uh, and good, you know, on uh, applied examples of best practice. But I think, um, I mean, for example, I mean, we know that um, you know, prioritization is key and um, um, a high dependency, for example, on area, uh, or say, say water resources uh, in an area where um, um, of increasing water scarcity. Um, you know, we know that um, there are um, benchmarks uh, and um, um, rules of thumb that can be applied in this context to sort of identify, if you like, um, you know, whether a, a particular dependency or impact is going to be more material than another. Um, and I think this is where, um, you know, part of the solution, again, you know, is, is about um, identifying and prioritising, you know, sort of using a combination of qualitative and quantitative approaches across your, um, um, mm. across your operations, you know, what your top sort of um, 10 to 20 um, key um, risk hotspots might be on a qualitative basis, um, perhaps tracking them over time. Um, let's not forget that um, you know, the publication of your first uh, TNFD report is going to probably provide a, a snapshot, um, not necessarily a complete snapshot of your whole value chain, um, and that risk exposure is going to change over time. Great. I think the second part of the question is especially interesting as well. This regards to, particularly with regards to positive or enhancement actions as mm. well. I don't know if that segues a bit to the strategy and transition planning that's come up so many times. But, but Luke, I mean, do you have any specific thoughts on that about the financial materiality regarding positive and enhancement actions? Yeah, a few quick thoughts and, and jumping back on the, the greenwashing, recognizing we have uh, friends on. ICAW here on the line, I'd say get to know your accountants and uh, those who can help you with internal controls, internal audit, and then the, the assurance as well. That can definitely go a long way to help with the, uh, the greenwashing question. I mean, it's earlier stage, of course, on nature. But then on um, financial materiality, yeah, again, I agree this is this is an area that needs more focus. Um, It'll come, I think, partly when the uh, ISSB develops its uh, work, but but companies can get started in particular, and I mentioned this before, with these sort of, um, you can almost start with just illustrative example, but uh, this mapping of, well, a potential or actual uh, risk opportunity, then through to what's the business effect. You know, again, start small and then think about, well, what's the financial effect on, on balance sheet or profit and loss, but you can even just more what's than that, just say, well, we know that we might have to spend a bit more in terms of investment there to mitigate a risk or, or we might just need to you know, know that we need to change something on our assurance insurance provision to, to make sure that we're covered for a particular risk there so just do that kind of mapping of a particular category of, of nature risk or uh, opportunity through to what does that then mean for the business and then well, what could that mean for uh, potential financials mm -hmm. and and you could then sort of highlight some of those as uh, you know, potentially significant and you go further on the quantification you could start then to use some of the particular scenarios you could start to look at okay particular i think we're very, very 
very Sorry. close to time. Uh, Luke. So, I, I mean, hey, I want to stay and keep talking about this through, but I want to say thank you to all three of you. I think this gives this global view of what's happening in terms of regulation, creating the support network that's needed to drive this all the way through to all three of you working with people doing this, doing it yourselves as well. So it gives that slightly practical emphasis. I mean, we went over at time, but transition planning, I'm surprised how often it's come up. Genuinely surprised as that being such a focal point for driving this. I think that point about the ISSV, we now have a focal point for how this is going to be harmonized, streamlined, mainstreamed. Um, but then also the, the point that we keep hearing, get started with what you have in front of you. You've already got a good foundation from climate, biodiversity will be new, but there's so much that you can do using it as well. But getting that started and knowing you have a plan for how to mature it over years is, is remains the key ingredient to this. Uh, but thank you all three of you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, Caroline, as well. Uh, enjoy the rest of your days and thank you to the audience as well. Uh, we'll be following up with an email to, with a link to the recording and for the survey as well. So thank you, everybody.